Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sue, very much. And again, good morning. And good morning for those of you watching online. Uh, as we turn to God's word, and we're going to be looking at this passage on page 1180, you might like to keep it open in front of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you... Please give us such a faith in Christ that we would always rejoice in him. Amen. Well, I wonder what gives you joy. Uh, I did a bit of Googling last year. The Daily Mirror produced a list of the 50 top things that bring people joy. Uh, it didn't say how they found these out, but here are the top five. Number one, sunny days and clear blue sky. So uh, that should put us in a good mood. Getting into bed with freshly washed sheets, walks in the country, watching your favourite TV show, finding a great bargain. Well, you can look at the uh, other 45 if you want to. I also discovered there is an International Day of Happiness, at least according to Age UK, which tells me research shows we're happiest between the ages of 65 and 79. <laughs> Uh, they, don't, they don't list what makes people happy, but they have a number of quotes um, from uh, people. Talking, making treacle toffee, a good wife, my first cuppa in the morning, a text from one of my grandchildren, and then someone called Teresa covers quite a lot of bases. Family, friends, pets, and ice cream. Well, what about the Christian life? Does it bring us joy? In the letter to the Philippians, the word joy or rejoice occurs 16 times in uh, our passage, chapter 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. In other words, be joyful. Why does he say it? Or at chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Why does he repeat it? Well, I assume it's because it's not what they were doing and not what they were experiencing. Because most Christians appear more joyful than they actually feel on the inside. Let me quote from this book, Gentle and Lowly, by Dane Auckland, bought for me by my wife for my birthday, but it took Johnny's 
uh, recommendation, saying it's one of the best Christian books you'd ever read, to actually get me to read it uh, a couple of months ago. Let me start with some words from the introduction. This book is written for the discouraged, the frustrated, the weary, the disenchanted, the cynical, the empty. Those running on fumes. Those whose Christian lives feels like constantly running up a descending escalator. Those of us who find ourselves thinking, how could I mess up that bad again? It is for that increasing suspicion that God's patience with us is wearing thin. For those of us who know God loves us, but suspect we have deeply disappointed him. Who have told others of the love of Christ, yet wonder if, as for us, he harbours mild resentment. Who wonder if we have shipwrecked our lives beyond what can be repaired who are convinced we've permanently diminished our usefulness to the Lord, who've been swept off our feet by perplexing pain and are wondering how we can keep living under such numbing darkness, who look at our lives and know how to interpret the data only by concluding that God is fundamentally parsimonious. I turn the page. It is written, in other words, for normal Christians. Well, Paul wants us to experience joy, and a joy that isn't dependent on circumstances, like having a sunny day, or treacle toffee, or a good wife. And he's going to show us where not to look for joy, and where to look for joy. And joy is such an attractive and desirable quality. I don't know about you, but if you were to stop and to think around the congregation, perhaps those sitting around you, someone who exhibits joy. And don't you think, wouldn't I like to be more like them? <laughs> wouldn't it we love to have a life more characterised by joy? But Paul's clear we can lose joy, which is why he writes in chapter 3, verse 1, Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. So he says, I'm repeating things you should already know. Why? Because they are in constant danger of forgetting the secret of joy. I think it's very common to start off in the Christian life filled with joy. As perhaps we are overwhelmed by a sense of the forgiveness and transformation and hope that the gospel gives us. But as time goes by, perhaps over many years, it seems as if we spring a leak and joy gradually starts to drain out. And Paul says that it is all to do with where we have confidence. It's a word he repeats in verses 3 and 4. So we're robbed of joy when, at the end of verse 3, we put confidence in the flesh. Well, what does flesh mean in, uh, in Paul's writing? Well, if you're alert this morning, reverse the word and take off the H. Reverse the Self, well done. Self, confidence in the things we do to get right with God. We receive joy when we put confidence in what Christ does. Well, let's look in a little more detail at what Paul has to teach us under two headings. Confidence in ourselves steals joy. Confidence in Christ inspires joy. So first, confidence in ourself steals joy. Let's look again at verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, this is pretty shocking language. Very strong. Dogs. Now, these are not your cuddly domestic pets. These are the wild scavengers. And who are these people? It may sound like they're some kind of violent criminal gang roaming the streets of Philippi. But actually, Paul is talking about a religious group. When he mentions mutilators of the flesh, he's talking about 
the act of circumcision. You see, there's the contrast there in verse 3. We who are the circumcision, or the true circumcision. So, the people described in verse 2 are those who are claiming to be Christians, but teaching that in order to be a Christian, you have to also follow the Jewish law, including being circumcised. This group appears uh, in a number of churches that Paul found, sometimes called the Judaizers. And it seems that from the outside, they would have been some of the most respectable people in society. Indeed, some of the most moral people in the church would almost certainly be here amongst us this morning. Well, why then is Paul so totally hostile to them? Well, I wonder if you know Bible maths. Bible maths goes like this. There are various bits of Bible maths, but here's one. To add is to subtract. It's a bit of Bible maths. To add is to subtract. To say that in order to, it, to have the joy of salvation, you need to add something to Jesus Christ, like circumcision, is actually to subtract from the work of Jesus Christ, to lose or out on that joy, in fact, ultimately to lose out on salvation itself. To add is to subtract. Another Bible word is legalism adding laws as well as the work of Christ. And often it's very subtle as it gradually shifts us, perhaps imperceptibly, from what God has done for me to what I need to do for God. Well, Paul uses his own life as an example of just this trend. In fact, he says he was a superstar legalist before he became a true believer. He says, look, I, I've tried the rules and regulations route and it didn't work. Verse 4, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, the self, what we do, I have more. And he gives us several examples of this confidence in the flesh, in what we do. Three R's. So how do we know when we're falling into this trap of legalism? Well, first we begin to trust in rituals. Uh, I have more, verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. Well, we have our own rituals today. We might say, I've been baptised, I've been confirmed. All right and good things to do, but if we start trusting in those things for our salvation, then our joy is in trouble. Second, we begin to trust in religion. Verse 5, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So, he was a member of the Israel in the Old Testament, the church of its day. How might this apply to us? Well, I'm a Christian because I've been brought up in a Christian country, or I went to a Church of England school, or I go to church. Okay, all fine and good things but they don't save us. I think there's a slightly more subtle version uh, of this for some of us. It might think, well, I go to the right kind of church. I go to a lively church. So I guess that must mean I have a lively faith, or I go to a sound church. So that must mean I have a, a, a sound biblical faith. Great things, but not the source of our joy. And third, we can begin to trust in rules. So back to uh, verse 5, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, so the Pharisees were the sort of spiritual elite of that age, they aimed to keep every one of the 619 biblical commandments and to keep them scrupulously, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now, I don't mean many people today who are... Uh, rigorous in saying that they keep every biblical law, but I quite often meet people uh, who have a version of this. They select one or two laws from the Bible and say, well, at least I've kept those. Have you ever had anyone who said to you, well, I've never murdered anyone? As though that's the kind of level uh, that we're to operate at. But behind 
behind that is the principle that if I'm good enough, then God accepts me. And who is in the greatest danger here this morning of being a legalist? Well, it's almost certainly me. Probably followed by Johnny, and Ian is coming close up on the rails. <laughs> it's the, it's the, the officially religious. We are the ones who are in the greatest danger of believing our own publicity. Of thinking that because of some position, that makes us more acceptable to God. And if that is the case, it will eventually diminish our joy. Let me uh, share with you a famous example from church history, John Wesley. John Wesley was ordained as a Church of England minister back in 1725. And uh, he devoted himself to studying the Bible, to prayer, uh, to works of charity with the poor. He visited prisoners. In fact, he was so zealous, he went off on a two-year mission to North America to share the gospel with the Native Americans. But he came to realize that this was a sort of false religion. In his own words, as he looked back on this, that time, he wrote this. In this refined way of trusting to my own works and my own righteousness, I dragged on heavily until the time of my eve leaving England and I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who will convert me? So he's, he's working so hard, and yet he's saying he dragged on heavily heavily. That's what his, his life felt like. Well, if any of these things are the basis of our confidence before God, it will steal our joy. And looking back on his pre-Christian days, Paul three times says he now counts them loss. They're not just neutral, they're actually negative. Verse 7, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. And you may know the word rubbish there refers to the kind of thing you might step on and have to wipe off the bottom of your shoe. You can imagine perhaps uh, giving someone a gift at Christmas, beautifully wrapped, and there's a box which... Uh, says uh, Swiss chocolates on the top. Your boss opens it, or your friend, or your family. They open it, and inside is dog poo. Sorry, it's at this time, a bit early in the morning for that. <laughs> but Paul says, this is how his attempts at good works will appear before God. He says, I view them as garbage, as poo. And he is trying to present them to God. It's a very vivid image. Well, what's the antidote? Let's move on. What's the antidote? Confidence in Christ inspires joy. Paul's already pointed us in the right direction, right up there in verse 1. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Now, he doesn't uh, just say rejoice. This isn't a sort of classic FM spirituality. If you listen to classic FM, it's all about, you know, if you just uh, uh, can put, a, what, put to one side the pressures of the day, you know, slip into your Radox bath, listen to your classic FM. No, it's rejoice in the Lord. It's specifically in relationship with Jesus Christ that we are and can be joyful. And see how Paul repeats the point again and again. Uh, verse 7, uh, for the sake of Christ. Uh, verse 8, the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may gain Christ. And again, verse 9, be found in him. Why this repeated emphasis? Why is Christ so vital? to a true confidence and a lasting joy. Well, 
Paul tells us in verse 9. To be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, from what we do, but that comes, which is through faith, in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Now, this is Gospel 101. I hope many of you will know this very well. But Paul says it's worth repeating because we are constantly in danger of forgetting it or forgetting the reality of it. Let me just highlight the four steps. First off, it's about righteousness. It's about being in the right with God, what we sometimes call salvation. And righteousness in the Bible is not just saying that our sins are forgiven, glorious truth that is, but positively the status that is Uh, set upon us as children of God. So all our sins are forgiven, yes, but we are given every blessing uh, in Christ as beloved children of God. It's about righteousness. It's about righteousness from God. How do we get this righteousness? How are we saved? How do we achieve the status of children of God? Well, it's the righteousness that comes from God. It it can't be earned. Uh, It's a gift. Let me just uh, quote again from uh, Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortland. Picture a 12-year-old boy growing up in a healthy, loving family. As he matures through no fault of his parents, he finds himself trying to figure out how to really assure himself a place in the family. One week, he tries to create a new birth certificate for himself. The next week, he determines to spend all his extra time scrubbing the kitchen clean. The following week, he determines to do all he can to imitate his dad. One day his parents question his strange behaviour. I'm just doing all I can to secure my place in the family. How would his father respond? How would you respond? Calm yourself, my dear son. There's nothing you could possibly do to earn your place among us. Our status before God is a gift. A righteousness from God. Third step, we receive this gift of righteousness by faith. We don't pay for it, we receive it. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Picture I mentioned it before. My love of faith is of empty hands. That's what faith looks like. It's the way we, we receive a gift or possibly grab a life belt. It's trusting someone to say, Enough to say, yes, I desperately need that. Thank you. Faith is saying to God, I need your forgiveness. I I want to receive this transformed status. And it is specifically, fourthly, faith in Christ. We gain this incredible, undeserved gift of righteousness, not because of what we have done for him, but because of what Christ has done for us. When we have Christ, we have everything. Everything to be acceptable to God, confident of our status, our future absolutely assured. No wonder, verse 3, he talks about those who boast in Christ Jesus. That's the opposite. That's the antidote. Confidence in the flesh? No, boast in Christ Jesus. Let me take you back to John Wesley. For years and years, he was ordained, (laughs) trusting in himself and his own righteousness. He writes at the moment when he finally receives the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. It's a famous words, he says, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sin, even mine, 
and save me from the law of sin and death. Well, how might we apply this to ourselves? Possible. One or two of us are here thinking, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm honestly not sure if I'm really trusting in Christ or myself. How would I, how would I know? Well, again, I think verse 1 is so helpful. The passage begins with this wonderful phrase. It's repeated, rejoice in the Lord. Turn your thoughts, as we've already done in a number of ways in this service, to the Lord Jesus, to all that he has done for us, and to all that is offered us through him. Do I rejoice in that? Does it bring me joy that my past is dealt with, that in the present I am a beloved child of God and that my future is secure in him? We may have wobbles and doubts, but do we look to Christ and rejoice in him? What do we delight in spiritually? Is it Christ? And perhaps for many others of us, that earlier description, I think there's a lot of truth in this for myself. I look back to my earlier days in the Christian life and something of the freshness and the joy of the gospel was more apparent. Have I slipped back into a bit of confidence in the flesh? Well, Paul invites us again, rejoice in the Lord. Perhaps let's pray, I'll do this now to open our eyes to any false confidence we've got that will deprive us of joy. That we might say yes again to Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we we come and say we are full of joy at what you have done and what you have done for us. These great events we've sung about and thought about over recent weeks, you dying and rising for us. That you have gained everything we could ever need. That as we look to you alone, we can have no greater blessing. No more needs to be done. We are beloved children. And we ask that in our lives that do often feel like we are walking up the downwards escalator spiritually. That as we walk with you, Lord Jesus, you would perhaps restore to us the joy of our salvation. So we thank you. Amen.